Yes, we are ready. You can start. OK, we're ready. Yeah. <clears throat> so the topic today is um, data collection with Apache Flume. So um, these are the outlines. We'll first talk about what is data collection. So, <clears throat> so in the big data era, uh, data collection plays the most important role. So we are actually uh, proceeding through the age of digitalization and we have lots of digital gadgets. So and the Internet also provides us unlimited source of data. So these type of data are important in various types of business and the traditional industry. They need to acquire this, analyze this and also uh, store this in a uh, good sophisticated way so that they can process it later for their business related goals and for example, let us assume that we would like to uh, build a system that uh, recommends uh, interest. So the first step would be we will gather data. So let's say different types of uh, uh, reviews of restaurants from different websites and store them in a database. But it's actually um, so we are interested in raw text and we will use it for analytics. So um, what the thing is, uh, it's not relevant where the data will be stored. The data must be stored in a way where we can sophistic uh, sophisticatedly uh, process this. And uh, in order to implement big data app application, we need to work it in real time. And uh, big data actually is a uh, disguised voluminous amount of structured, semi structured, and but it takes a lot of time and money if we load it in traditional related databases. So now new approaches are there for collecting and analyzing data and to gather and mine big data for information. So from there, we can apply many machine learning and artificial intelligence program. So our current problem is that we are generating more and more data every day from our smartphone laptop. And the problem is that companies want to analyze and gather insights from this huge amount of data. So as far as you, as you can see that the data is increasing exponentially. So it's an exponential curve. So you can see that we will have lots of data and we have to have a reliable, scalable, extensible and manageable way to gather the data. So here comes Flume. So Apache Flume is a um, reliable, distributed, and uh, sorry. So Apache Flume is a reliable, uh, distributed, and con configurable, configurable. Uh, sorry, yes, what is this? Can you can can you run here? Hello. Yes, yes, you can hear. Yeah, we can hear you. We are on mute okay. so that we don't disturb you. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, <clears throat> so Apache Flume is a highly reliable, distributed, and configurable streaming tool. This is for uh, aggregating and transporting large amounts of streaming data, such as log files, events from various sources. And we, what we do, that we collect data from various web servers, and we then process it, and we then uh, aggregate and transport it to a centralized data store like HDFS and AWS. It was developed by Cloudera. So what are the features of Flume? Flume collects data efficiently. The ag 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 we can aggregate the data and move large amount of data from different sources to centralized store. So these are, these are uh, Flume has simple and flexible architecture. From multiple machines, we can collect data. And Flume is not only related to uh, log data aggregation. So we can transport massive amount of data like social media generated data, email messages, and pretty much anything that is related to the business. And it has many built-in supports and destination platforms to integrate with. So now comes Flume architecture. So what happens that in Facebook, Twitter, they have data generators and they have web servers. So in their web servers, they collect and they store the log data and events. So we'll talk about them in a few minutes. So what happens that the data generators generate data and the Flume agent, the Flume have the Flume architecture has the Flume has this agent thing. So Flume agents collects data from them, and then it processes to the data collector. And in between this thing, there is also called a processor, which processes and aggregates data, which is an optional thing if you, you can do it. So what happens that from data generators, the agent and the data goes to the agent, and the agent goes to the data collector, which then stores to the centralized data stores like HDFS or HBS. So what is event? So event is a single log entry or basic unit of data which we transport further. So if, if you can see if uh, the previous one, okay. So a single data which passes through this, we can call it an event. An event is composed of zero or more headers in a body. 
so we talked about log so what is log a log file is in computing a log file is a file that records either occurrences in an operating system so anything that operates so in anything that happens you open a file you do something so that the log file will be stored in your system that you open this file user is this and other software so this is a different kind of messages from different kind of uh, different users these are stored in system and logging is an act of keeping a log so these log files are really important and these are uh, like in uh, event is a single log entry which we transport and i talked about ag agent so agent is a jvm process which receives the data so you can see the flume agent here at the left corner so it has three parts source channel and sync so you can pretty much think of it as an usb cable so the usb cable the long wire is channel the one part is source and one part is sync so from our hard disk we store we store things from our external hard disk like we connect our port and we store the data or we transport the data from our machine so it's simple like that and flume may have more than one agent like we have seen from the previous video and it has three components flume source flume channel and flume sync processor so i talked about processor like uh, the intermediate processing and aggregation which happens before data collection before data collector happens so it has like you can see source happen comes and the decoder we we do with this type of things like extract browser name from log entry and attach it to event and different types of things to aggregate the data so that our summer so can we can summarize and then collector what collector does is the collector collects so you can see that it's also a it's also an agent data collector is also an agent it has source and sync it collects collects data from various agents and then it uh, passes to the sync to the channel and then to the sync and then it's stored to the hdfs store component of agent is source one component source so source what is source flume source is configured within an agent and it actually listens for the events from an external source like from a web server like when the when we ask from the web server different as a log files we request log files and they and the flume source listens for that events it reads the data it handles it also handles various of failure situations but flume doesn't know how to store a event it's just like the a uh, usb 3.0 port thing like it doesn't know how to store the data so it passes to the uh, channel as so after receiving the data enough to pr produce a flume event a single log event a single uh, event that we pass basic unit of data it sends event to the channel to which the source is connected and the flume source send and the external source also sends events to a flume in a format that is recognized by the target flume source so there are various types of flume source we will use this twitter source today to show one example Uh, component of flume channel <clears throat> channels are common uh, communication bridges so it's a long wire in the usb channel the communication bridges between sync and source once the flume source receives an agent it stores in one or more channels it can store in one or more channels the channel is a passive store that keeps the event until is it it's consumed by a flume sync so there are two types of popular channels memory channels uh, it stores the event from an in memory queue and from there events will be accessed by sync so because of software and hardware failure if the agent process dies in the middle then like ram all of your events all of your data will, that stored in the memory channel will be lost forever so it it is increasingly fast you can see the memory channel is increasing it's uh, fastest but it has the risk of lo data loss it's just like ram and the file channel is just like you can, you can think of it as a hard disk it's slow but it it will effectively provide guaranteed delivery the file channel it, it is backed by local uh, file system so unlike memory channel uh, file channel actually writes the contents to the file to the file system uh, that is deleted only after the successful delivery of the sync uh, the flume channel is like i said is fastest but it has it has its own limits so in different types of things we use different types of uh, sorry uh, okay shit uh, okay. Uh, yeah so uh, the last uh, component of agent is sync so um, what sync uh, sync does is sync takes the event from the uh, channel and then it puts in external repository like hdfs or it also forwards to the data collector like we say the flume source of the next agent or the data collector or it can also pass it to the uh, next agent or we or it will do uh, another processing of things so that we can aggregate and the source and the sync within the given run uh, asynchronously uh, it's not really that important so one thing that will that i will show so what we have learned that the data generators which run from in the on the web servers they 
sends data when you request from the flume agent the sends data <clears throat> the single uh, the different types of log entries and the agent all source connects the source takes all the data passes to the channel and the sync collects collects the data until it's a an event and then it, it then it can pass to another agent or it can also pass to data collector which is also an happen which is also a, uh, an agent and then it also and then after collecting all this thing the data collector then passes to the centralized data store and it's stored in the hdf or hfs so there are different types of data flows in flume first one is multi hop data flow so what happens that uh, multi hop data flow is that so the data goes to the agent and there and instead of going to the data collector it also passes to another agent in the between that's so like this and then it will go to multiple agents before it goes to centralized data store so this is multi hop data fan out flow so fan out uh, is like um, is just like uh, you have one source and you have multiple channels so in flume data is is two cat it's of two categories that uh, first one is uh, replicating so <clears throat> it is that kind of data flow where the data will be replicated in all the configured channels so you will replicate data so that uh, you can back up your data so you can you will replicate all this data and so that you don't you don't have to worry about this if you, if the one of the servers goes down you will have backups option so this fan out flow is the, is important in that cases multiplexing so uh, we can say that the data flow whether data will be sent to a selected channel. so multiplexing is like uh, we can choose who, on which type of data it will be uh, on which type of channel it will be sent so uh, the data will be sent to a selected channel so uh, yeah it, it, it is uh, mentioned in the header of the event where which channel it will fix and then it will pass it to the uh, channel fan out flow uh, the data will be transformed from many sources to one channel so it can say fan in so fan in is like uh, all that uh, agent will go to like uh, what can i say uh, all the sources from many sources it will go to one channel so these are the three types of uh, data flow in flume so <clears throat> flume has uh, flume is extremely reliable in what sense we will see uh, so in flume there are actually two transactions that happens one at the sender one at the receiver so one at one at the uh, source and another thing so the sender sends uh, events to the receiver so what happens that uh, when the receiver commits its own reason so the sender takes a uh, commits a transaction and it sends events to the receiver so when the receiver commits its own transaction and send receive signal to the sender soon after receiving data then the sender commits its transaction just after receiving the signal so it's like if anything happens uh, after the receiver can, doesn't commit its own transaction and cannot send so the uh, sender will not commit its transactions and they will try again So it is the thing that the reliable. So Flume is transactional approach. So the agent goes to collector. So in some way it it cannot go to and uh, there is an error. So it will store the data in some way, some backup options, and then it will send again. It will try again. If it's again fail, if it fails again, then it will try again. And then after after best effort and store on failure and some point it will pass and it will. Store or in age difference if, if it doesn't then it will uh, or, of course end scaffold uh, uh, scalable you can see that there are multiple agents i have seen in the pictures there are multiple agents and they will store a massive amount of data in the collector and the collector will effectively store the room also connects uh, load balancing problems just so one uh, one point here uh, to add if you go back to your previous slide uh, Uh, the transactional slide the okay. slide slide before yes here um so this is correct uh, so what you are saying is flume uses a transactional approach so what do we mean by transactional approach is that uh, you know this is exactly the same i mean this transaction has the same meaning as we studied in our rdbms course so either it is all or nothing so what it means is um, flume knows that okay if all these things should flow so everything flows or nothing flows so in between if something goes wrong then there is a retry to uh, transfer everything once again so that's why we call it a transactional approach yeah okay all right
Cool. Thank Let's you. move on. So, um, so I've seen that Flume is also uh, very scalable. Uh, this is like horizontal scalable control paths. Uh, it's not really that. And so, uh, Flume is also extensible. You can see simple source and sync API. It has simple architecture. As a plugin architecture, like add your own source sync. Like we will see all these things in our next uh, slide uh, when Rahit Rohit will show you the Twitter thing. So you can all add your own source choice things and decorators. Uh, Flume is extremely manageable and, and it is really good and it has really nice uh, API system. Uh, so we, we will see the next few couple uh, like here. So I will uh, transfer it to uh, Rohit who will show you the Twitter data collection thing. Great, yeah, thanks. So let me just summarize what we have discussed so far. Um, so uh, Flume uses an agent-based architecture. Um, so we have multiple agents doing something and the agents follow this source channel sync kind of design. Uh, and uh, the source channel sync kind of design is uh, particularly interesting because uh, it gives you the option to change the source and syncs. Um, the syncs can be, let's say, a HDFS store. The sync can be, let's say, uh, RDBMS or a file or whatever. So it's very easy to you just change the configuration and you can change the sync. And similarly, you change the configuration and you change the source. But the rest of the code just remains the same. So if you are moving data from some source X to some sync Y, then all these things can be easily uh, done through configuration. And that doesn't require read deployment or rebuilding the code and so on. So that's the beauty of uh, Flume as uh, Shadil rightly uh, mentioned. Uh, and of so course, sir, uh, uh, one question uh, <coughs> sure. is it is just so you can think of it like an USB cable. It is just like, is it like that that we have? Is it like it is like that, but uh, the USB at least has two defined uh, interfaces right so on this side on on that side the interface of the cable has yeah, yeah, very interface. defined interface but here you have it's like a, a cable with five options on the left side and some 10 options on the right side right so all you have okay. to do is select which option you want so rdbms to file system or file system to hdfs so all these things can be easily done by simply configuring the source and sync in some config file so it's about just writing one or two lines in the config files and you are done almost it's that simple the code to actually go and write to hdfs the code to pull from dbms all these things are already given to you which is the beauty of uh, using this sourcing kind of design yeah okay and and of course uh, when we talk about moving data around uh, it's not only moving the data we have to worry about so many other concerns like you rightly mentioned you know what happens if in between there is an error then there should be some mm. some library to retry uh, and then you have to ensure that everything that I transmitted goes as one unit, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, backups and things like that. So all these things uh, are done already for you in Flume. And that's why the library is so interesting and useful. And when we are working with big data, something keeps going wrong all the time. So it is important that we don't uh, write HDFS and MapReduce jobs every time. So instead of writing MapReduce job ourselves, it's better to use these kind of middleware. So that's the whole idea behind uh, uh, what Shadil uh, presented in detail. Right, Shadil? Did I summarize correctly? Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. All right. Thank you. OK, so okay. we'll continue with uh, the Roy? second part. Yeah, so I'll take over. So we'll be looking into Twitter data collection. Hold on. I will just share the screen first. OK, so is it working? Yes, I can see the screen. So we'll be looking into the Twitter data collection. So what happens is a web server generates log data and this data is collected by an agent in Flume. And the channel buffers this data to a sync, which finally pushes it to the centralized store, such as the SDFS. So what are the steps we have to take? So firstly, we have to cre create the Twitter application, then we start the SDFS, and then we configure the Flume. So while creating the Twitter application, we have to go to the Twitter website, uh, apps.twitter.com where we sign into our account, and then in the Twitter application management window, we can create, delete, or manage the Twitter apps. Now we click on the Create New App button, and in that we have to fill up the form where we include the name of the app, the property, the description of the app, and then we have to put in a website address where we have to put in the complete URL pattern that, that is HTTP colon slash slash whatever the website link is. Now after this, we'll be getting the um, developer agreement which we have to accept as usual and then we create the twitter application and after the application is created 
we'll see keys and access tokens tab at the bottom of the page which will give us four different keys which are uh, pretty much needed while configuring the source so the keys will be uh, as we will be seeing uh, right. the consumer key yeah uh, just wanted to add over here uh, uh, so if you go back and look at the web services lecture that i had given so yes. i mentioned about uh, authentication and there yeah. i mention about oauth and i also mention about keys and access tokens and this yeah. is exactly an an example of that um so i'm glad to see that here um so whenever we are signing up with an with a web service like in this case uh, twitter api yeah. uh you know we need to authenticate ourselves and for that we are actually getting the keys and the access keys tokens yes, yes exactly so, thank you so much yes please yeah. go ahead so we click on it to generate the access token and we get the four tokens that is the consumer key consumer secret access token and access token secret now we click on the test oauth button uh, at the uh, you know the uh, the application at, at the top right we will be getting the test oauth button and in that we will be click uh, when we click that we have to uh, copy all these four keys so that we can uh, you know like use them during the uh, configuration of the source now we go into the starting of the sdfs so we run this command docker run and whatever in the uh, terminal to start the sdfs and the, then we create the directory hadoop dfs and kdir as the twitter directory which we are creating to configure the files in that so in the configuration of flow we have to configure the source the channel and the sync using the configuration file in the conf folder in the hadoop directory now in the example given in this slide we'll be using the uh, apache flume uh, the experimental source that is twitter one person firehose memory channel and the sdfs sync so what is it about the twitter one person firehose memory so this source is highly experimental it connects to the one person sample um, twitter firehose using the streaming api and continuously downloads tweets converts them to avro format and sends avro events to a downstream flume sync so we directly uh, we directly uh, by default get this uh, during the installation of flume and and so on now we set the class path so while setting the class path we have to look into the uh, uh, the different properties of sources which we will be uh, configuring that is the channel the source type the consumer key the consumer secret access token and access token secret these four are the things which we have already copied earlier and then the maximum batch size which is the number of twitter message messages that should be included in the batch the default value is 1000 and the maximum batch duration millis in the milliseconds so many uh, to wait before we close the batch now in the channel we are here using the memory channel so to configure it to the memory channel we have, we have to provide the type of the channel so in the type there are like uh, two or three i don't know actually but i know exactly like three type of memory uh, three type of channels which we can be using and then uh, there is this capacity it is the maximum number of events that are stored in the channel and the transaction capacity which is the maximum number of events the channel accepts or sends in go so the sdfs sync this sync writes the data into the sdfs and in this we need the following properties like channel the type and the sdfs path so we will be looking into this complete configuration file after a while and yeah here only so we see the uh, complete uh, configuration file so we uh, i'll be starting from the beginning so firstly we name the components of the current agent that is the twitter agent dot sources which is twitter now twitter agent dot channel which gives the memory channel and mem channel and twitter agent dot sync which is which we are calling sdfs now while configuring the source so we can see the twitter dot type in this one sorry uh in this one we put in the type the source type which we are using after that we put in the four keys we got consumer key consumer secret access token and access token secret now the main part the keywords keywords are those words which we are finding uh, which we are looking for in the tweets like in this case we are looking for tutorials point java big data map reduce mahot hbase and no sql now we configure the same while configuring on sync sync we are using the type of the hdfs that is hdfs type then the hdfs path this is the path where the data will be um, stored or we can look into the data uh, using this path and 
file type uh, represent the type of the data like uh, type of the stream that is the data stream which you are getting and write format is the format in which the data is being stored that is a text format batch size batch size shows the uh, i guess the yeah the file size the file size is uh, the number of files which can be contained is said the batch size the role size is the number of uh, files which we uh, which are uh, stored before a role occurs that is called the role size and when it is zero it means that uh, like we are not considering the uh, number of files which we are storing and the count size is uh, role count is basically the number of events that are being stored before a file is rolled right um well actually the exact meaning of each of these properties would obviously be available on the website so yeah, we are yeah, not yeah. interested much on that but what yeah. is interesting here is um, in one shot you can now see everything in action exactly. so we we discussed about agents and here we are talking about a twitter agent nice and then we said um, there is this source channel sync kind of an architecture yeah. and now here we see the sources the channels and the syncs mentioned so what we are here trying to do is put the data from twitter into hdfs and so the source is twitter the sync is hdfs and then the question is what kind of channel you want to use we are happy with a memory channel memory. so we just use the memory channel we hope nothing goes power off and we don't lose the data and even if it goes off probably it doesn't matter too much to us yes. all right so we have this mem channel defined over there so that's the yeah. source channel sync kind of design and then we start configuring each of them so we have the source configurations we have the channel configurations and then we have the sync configurations right. now these things vary from source to source so uh, probably today we are using twitter so we are talking about the twitter source configuration properties that are possible tomorrow probably we'll be using something else let's say yahoo finance or um, google maps or so it depends on what you want to use as a source and accordingly the properties might uh, change yeah. uh, right and uh, another interesting thing uh, to notice in this slide is the authentication schemes so obviously yeah. when you are talking to a source and pulling data from there you want to authenticate yourself uh, 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 and uh, we are using oauth uh, security over here wow. and <clears throat> obviously when we say oauth security there must be some key and secret which uh, or access token uh, which has to be configured and that's what is over here so that's a one time setup that you do with twitter you uh, you grab the access token from there and you put it over here and uh, nobody apart from you knows uh, the both access token access and tokens. and now this is used to connect to twitter and get the data so yeah. that's all about it and uh, and interest i mean uh, i mean uh, all these things can now be seen in action in this one single slide which is uh, the best part of uh, this slide i believe yeah and after this uh, one more thing i need to point out we have to bind the source and the sync also to the channel so we use this uh, use this configuration twitter agent dot sources dot channels to bind the memory channel with the you know like the source and the sync so this is an important part also right yeah yeah and the next slide yeah so now we just execute this command cd flow home and we will get this window in uh, i have shown you the path here so this path will lead you to this window where you will get the log files one after the other with the block size and everything so yeah that's it i guess uh, thank you thanks so that was a nice quick um, uh, flume in action presentation so uh, i hope uh, everything is clear now on how flume works what is the architecture now we proceed to apache scoop uh, here we will go to like the what is scoop why how we use scoop where we use scoop then probably the architecture of scoop scoop 1 scoop 2 and we'll go through the commands and the various features of scoop so this is basically the outline i have not added the slide now but i will add it to add with later and give it to you great yeah if you can just close that small black window on the top uh, yeah just close that window please so we can see the slides clearly Please go ahead. Thanks. So, what each Apache scoop? Uh, uh, before the big data thing came into picture, where unstructured data can be processed, uh, there was the trend of structured data. Lot of things are stored in structured form, and one of 
two of the major things that store data in structured form are the RDBMS, RDBMS, and the mainframe systems. Uh, so initially, what we see, we uh, the sure, there is some uh, strong fan sound coming behind you. Is can you switch it off for a few minutes till okay, your sir. talk is over? Focus. Okay, Let me. Much better. Thanks. So, the thing, uh, thing is that earlier we used to have a lot of, uh, we have a system of structured data, and the system is now continuing also a lot of things like bank data and transaction details are structured. So these are need to be processed on HDFS. We need a bridge between them so that we can use the structured data to transfer it to the Hadoop distributed platform, and we can. Do our operations on them. So essentially, that is what Scoop does. Scoop builds that bridge which imports the data from the RTBMS or mainframe to HDFS and back from HDFS after the operations to our uh, DBMS and mainframe systems. So as we can see, Scoop is the tool designed to transfer data between Hadoop and relational database on mainframes. Scoop can be used to import data from a relational database management system such as mysql or oracle or a mainframe into hadoop distributed system and transform the data in hadoop map reduce and then export back to rdbms scoop automates most of its process relying on database to describe the schema of the data to be imported scoop uses map reduce to import and export the data which provides parallel operation as well as fault tolerance that is where scoop got its name from sql to hadoop and hadoop to sql uh, then we proceed to few more points about scoop big data developers who are start once data in hadoop system like in hdfs hive or hbase they do magical stuff <coughs> just a minute they do their magical stuff to find all the golden information hidden on such a huge amount of data. Before Scoop came, developers used to write import and export data between Hadoop and RDBMS, and the tool was needed to do the same. Again, Scoop uses the map reduce mechanism for its operations like import and export, work and work on parallel mechanism as well as fault tolerance. In Scoop, developers just need to mention the source, destination, and the rest of the work will be done by the Scoop tool which essentially reduces a lot of human effort and uh, we get our operations done. Scoop came and filled the gap between the transfer between relation database and Hadoop system. So that is basically what Scoop was. Now who uses Scoop? As I already said, key Scoop basically functions on structured data and earlier it was in the strength to store data in structured form. So uh, almost all the earlier existing forms like uh, database administration, data analyst, data engineers, they use Scoop for their day-to-day -day activities. So now we come to usage of Scoop. Scoop with Scoop, one can import data from relational database system or mainframe to HDFS. The input to the import process is either a database table or a mainframe data set. For databases, Scoop will read table row by row into HDFS. But essentially, HD Scoop treats each row of the table as a new record. For mainframe datasets, Scoop will read all the records from each mainframe dataset into HDFS. The output of this import process is a set of files containing a copy of the imported table or dataset. So basically, Scoop works on two types of things. One is database, one is mainframe. Uh, mainframe was a system which was earlier used before the incorporation of big data where mainframe used to batch process and gather useful insights from the data. Scoop, is, Scoop includes some other commands which allow you to inspect a database you are working with. For example, you can list the available database schemas. With Scoop list List, scoop list database tool and tables within a schema with scoop list tables tool. Scoop also includes a primitive SQL execution cell. Scoop is a collection of relation tools. To use scoop, you need to specify the tool you want to use and the arguments that control the tool. 
scoop compiled from its own so if scoop is compiled from its own source you can run scoop without a formal installation process by running the bin slash scoop program here is an example given of the thing how that particular thing is used uh, now we proceed towards scoop architecture as i told earlier scoop acts as a bridge between rdbms and hdfs so we can see the major components of scoop are import and export here import takes data from rdbms and transfers it to hdfs and after the processing is done the export tool gathers the data from hdfs and puts it back in the rdbms so that's essentially what is the architecture of scoop each uh, the first version of scoop is called scoop one and we can see what a scoop one architecture is uh, basically here we see the user gives command to the scoop on a command line interface and then <coughs> the scoop provides command. and we can see that in scoop one there is only map fetch the map fetch will run and reducer is not required because the complete import and export process doesn't require any aggregation so there is no need of reducers in scoop one so this is uh, essentially what the scoop one architecture is we pro we put some command in scoop one a scoop to scoop and scoop does the rest of things but uh, the name suggests that there is also another version out there and there must be some shortcomings in scoop one so here we will see what are the shortcomings in scoop one sometimes command line arguments can lead to errors in connector matching as the user has to decide which one to choose due to tight coupling between data transfer and serialization format some connectors support certain data format while others may not so here you see a lot of usage of the word connectors so we will come back to what is connector in a while scoop one is also insecure in some ways we will see later and connectors are forced to be gdbc model which is essentially a shortcoming of scoop one which paved the way for scoop two here we can see yeah just the, one small correction uh so we usually we spell scoop as s q w o p yes c o w o p uh so yeah this one is correct so the spelling that you use Achas. in this slide is correct yeah okay, okay sir okay. please go ahead Let's rectify it then we essentially come to scoop 2 architecture so scoop 2 architecture here you can see a lot of components which were not in scoop 1 architecture and you can see here the user here a command line interface the browser and a huge thing set of things and with the important thing is we can see a reduced task along with a map task so what are this we will walk through scoop to enables users to use scoop effectively with a minimal understanding of its detail by ha having a web application run on scoop which allows scoop to be installed once and used from anywhere here we can see scoop to uses both command line interface and browser which essentially makes it easier for someone who doesn't have a prolific knowledge about scoop can use scoop having a rest api for operation and management helps scoop tool to integrate better with external systems such as uji uji is basically a scheduler and what rest api does it provides the same functionality as that of a command line interface and here we come to the important part because of the reduced phase it allows connectors to be focused only on connectivity and ensures that scoop functionality is uniformly available to all connectors this facilitates ease of development of connectors so <clears throat> so now let's see what are the key differences in scoop 1 and scoop 2 scoop 1 is client only architecture but scoop 2 is both client and server architecture Scoop 1 requires client side installation and configuration, but Scoop 2 requires server side installation and configuration. In Scoop 1, clients have access to Hive H and HBase, making it insecure. But in Scoop 2, server has access to Hive and HBase, which is somehow secure. User in Scoop 1, user attached with management of connectors and drivers for various operations is JDBC based, but connectors and drivers 
can scoop to our managed central in one place and can be non jdbc based okay now my part is over i will hand over to shadu uh, Sh shadab to proceed further thanks um i just wanted to make one comment on uzi um Uzi was extremely popular uh, when I was uh, coding, so about uh, 2006-2007 times. Uh, probably it's still popular now. Uh, the main purpose we use Uzi is uh, for workflow management. We we see that uh, um, usually the jobs are more like a pipeline. So you do job one, job two, then job three, then job four, and so on. And there is a workflow like if this job does this kind of a thing or sees this kind of stuff then you should go go back and do something like that so think of a flow chart kind of a thing where uh, each node is some sort of a job or some part of the job um, so we so if you have an entire application as a workflow then uh, you want some middleware which can which will allow you to kind of see your entire thing as a workflow and allows you to define that workflow run that workflow you know a click of a button the entire workflow is submitted to hadoop so those kind of stuff uh, and uzi gives all the libraries required to do that um, there is another presentation on uzi schedule but i'm not sure whether somebody has picked it up uh, in this year um, so if you are lucky we'll probably go deeper into uzi but for now um, yeah uh, there are these kind of systems which can even talk to uh, Uzi. So that's the only point to uh, gather from here. All right, thanks. Okay. Uh, so can you see my screen? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, so right now I will be talking about the features of scope and uh, the, uh, what are the commands which are used in scope. Uh, so the first feature that we can see is the full load feature where Apache scope can actually load a whole table with a singular command from my database, uh, from any SQL database. Also, uh, Apache scope can also uh, be used to have incremental loading of database. Uh, uh, we can also see that Scoop uh, supports parallel import and export features. Uh, Scoop uses Yarn framework to import and export data, which provides fault tolerance on top of parallelism. Uh, Scoop, as we can also see, improves the uh, result of SQL's query. And uh, okay, the main, uh, the best part about Scoop is that uh, the uh, Scoop can be connected with of all the major RDBMS databases, which we will see in the further uh, at the end of a presentation on how it on which databases can it connect to. Also, Scoop can load data directly into Hive or HBS. Uh, okay, so going to the Scoop command, uh, these are the following commands that uh, Scoop has. Uh, we can use Scoop help uh, to find the usage of any command and. Uh, the, we will be uh, deep diving into two important, uh, two main commands. One is the import command, and the other is the export command. The other commands we will uh, go, uh, will will just uh, glance upon them. Okay. Uh, so scoop import is uh, basically used to import a singular ta individual table from an RDBMS file to an uh, to HDFS. Uh, we can uh, do for the first thing that we need to do is uh, to connect to the HB, uh, database server. So while connecting to database server, there are two uh, there is uh, there are two methods that we can use. We can directly connect to a database server, or we can uh, connect wow. to database server. I see my name there. Very happy. Uh, yes, <laughs> that's <laughs> the reason you. we use it also. Thank you. <laughs> Please go ahead. Uh, so uh, the another thing that we can do is uh, for databases which actually have uh, 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 username and password access, uh, Scoop can uh, do it with username and password uh, to uh, uh, to make sure that uh, the few uh, for a few databases where we want to protect uh, our password, Scoop can use aliases to uh, connect to the database. Uh, Scoop also can use a uh, SQL query which is uh, uh, to load data directly into the database in that manner we can actually filter out uh, quite if you have a huge database we can filter out quite a lot of data in this manner and load data to which we exclusively want to look at okay uh, 
uh so the import process of scoop uh, is in parallel so uh, because of the parallel import process mostly we have four import pro uh, the the mostly uh, scoop imports are done in four channels but it can also be increased uh, to eight or 16 but uh, we also need to keep in mind that uh, when we're increasing uh, the data uh, the pa parallelism it can also sometimes lead to a decrease in efficiency so uh, the developer needs to uh, properly code up, uh, properly find out the most effective manner in which imports can be done in the most in the, in the most efficient manner as possible uh, scoop, uh, scoop can also import uh, use uh, by default the import process will be using jdbc which is uh, the java database connector uh, which will provide a reasonable cross vendor import channel uh, some databases can perform imports in a more high performance fashion by using specific database uh, database specific data movements uh, for which we can see that mysql uh, mysql has a mysql dump tool which will uh, export data from mysql to other systems pretty quickly uh, scoop also has features of incremental import uh, where uh, which we talked about before where certain where only the new data which uh, will get imported into the scoop database uh, the data which can be imported into Scoop has two file formats. One is the de delimited text, and the other one is the sequence file. Uh, delimited text is the default is the most popularly used one, which is the default import format, and it is uh, appropriate for most non-binary data types. Uh, for sequence files, it's a binary format that stores individual uh, records and custom record-specific data types. These data types uh, are manifested as Java classes. Uh, Scoop will automatically generate these data types for us. Uh, the, sec uh, the second one that I talked about, which is the main function of Scoop, is uh, that Scoop exports whatever is uh, there in my HD, uh, uh, HDFS, uh, HDFS to my uh, uh, SQL database, RDBMS. Uh, so uh, this is a school uh, scoop export tool uh, now in default what scoop does is uh, scoop will directly insert into uh, my table so if my uh, table has any primary key where we want to uh, update data for those primary keys uh, we should not be using uh, the scoop uh, insert uh, scoop export but instead we will be using something called scoop update uh, this, uh, by default, all the columns will be for a table will be selected for update, but we can also uh, uh, change where we can have a certain subset of columns which will be updated. Uh, out here, we are talking about uh, the scoop import, uh, the scoop export commands, and how the update key and the insert key are the two basic uh, differences that we can have. Uh, now, uh, Okay, uh, so scoop uh, perform uh, the exports are performed by multiple writers in parallel, and each writer will use a separate connection to the databases. Uh, scoop has a multi-row insert syntax where you can have hundred records per uh, statements, and uh, so what happens with this is that uh, if there is a breakdown in the export process due to multiple transactions, we can see that. Uh, the atomicity of the data will not be maintained. We can have partial data which will be written into the databases. So for this, uh, what mostly we can do is we can overcome by staging the table via staging table option, which acts as an auxiliary table and use the stage to export the data. And, the, and then the final data is moved to the destination table in a single transaction. Uh, the other scoop functions are scoop validation. Uh, scoop validation will uh, validate the data cop uh, data copied either import or export by comparing the row counts from source and uh, and the target post copy uh, scoop job is a tool which can be used to create and work for uh, create and work for several saved jobs uh, saved jobs remember the parameters which are used to the job and they can be re executed instead of uh, re executed time to time instead of writing every time uh, something new uh, scoop meta store is a tool which is used to configure scoop to host a shared of a shared metadata repository uh, multiple users and uh, can users uh, can define and execute safe jobs uh, scoop merge is a tool which will allow me to allow any uh, any person uh, to merge two data sets where, ent where entries in one data set will override the entries in the uh, completely override the entries in the new data set 
scoop create a scoop create hive table is a popular is a table uh, tool which populates a hive meta store with a definition for a table based on database table previously imported to hdfs or one plan to be uh, imported this effectively performs the hive import step of scoop import without running the preceding import if the data was already loaded to hdfs we can use this tool to finish the pipeline of importing data to hive uh, scoop help will help me to list all the tools and scoop list tables will list all the tables in the database so the main objective of scoop is that it's a it's basically a tool which is used uh, for developers which is made for de developers to transfer data as a bulk from uh, rdbms uh, rd uh, from rdbms to uh, hdfs because since most of the data which is right now stored in this world is mostly in uh, rdbms scoop is a very effective tool for uh, uh, for programmers uh, the connectivity that i was talking about scoop is that scoop can be uh, scoop can be uh, used uh, to connect to uh, various data uh, databases we can see that scoop uh, scoop can connect to Post, uh, postgresql oracle database mysql and kubrit uh the limitations of scoop are uh, that scoop one scoop uh, has been started it cannot be paused or resumed uh, if it is failed we need to clear things which has been done before and we need to start again uh scoop export performance also depends upon the hardware configuration of this of a uh, hardware configuration of the rdbms server uh scoop is slow because it still uses map reduce and its backend processing uh failures uh, need special handling in scape or in case of partial import or export uh for and for a few databases uh, scoop provides bulk connector which has faster uh, performance that is all that we have for today sir